thanks so much for joining. We're uh, going to have an insider's view on drug development Nash, and I'm really excited to be here with Tim Batar, uh, who's been in the industry for more than 20 years, and and I think it's going to be able to teach us a lot today. So what we're going to do is have a a quick intro from Dimitar to tell you about himself. Um, and then I'm gonna lead through a, about a 20, 25 minute Q&A, and then we'll open it up to the audience um, to, to ask any questions that you have. And feel free to use the uh, the chat functionality, Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screens um, in order to add questions as we go along. So you don't have to wait until, uh, until we get to the Q&A session. So, it's a rough agenda there. A couple other things to add. We're going to be tweeting from our um, at Sonogenetics uh, Twitter handle, so feel free to follow us there. Join in um, if you'd like to and, and tag us in anything. We're also going to record. We are recording the session now, um, and we'll post it on the website and, and send out a video afterwards. So if you uh, don't want to be recorded for any reason, none of the audience names uh, will, will show up here unless you raise your hand to ask a question. and, and we unmute you to go live. So if you don't want to actually ask your question in person, um, then just say so in the chat uh, that you'd like to stay um, just as an anonymous chat. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off here and I'll, I'll stop screen sharing so we can focus. Um, I'll do a quick intro to myself and, and then I'll kick it over to you, Dimitar. I'm Patrick. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sano. We've developed an online platform uh, for online and at-home precision medicine studies. So we work across a number of different Therapy areas, NASH and NAFLD is, is a big area for us where we're working on clinical studies and observational studies focused on primarily discovery uh, of genetic biomarkers and genetically targeted uh, clinical trials. So we're going to ask a few questions around the, um, the genetic side of things here, but we're going to take a pretty wide lens because because I think Dimitar will be able to give us some insight on why drug development in NASH has been such a challenge um, and what has changed and, and what hasn't changed in the last at uh, 10, 10 years or so, um, and, and whether there are some glimmers of hope, as, as we were talking about at the start here, whether there's some changes due to COVID that mean we might be able to rethink uh, the strategy in some fundamental way. So Dimitar, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. It'd be great if you could just give a um, you know, five, five, 10 minute overview of yourself, your career, how you got into hepatology and, and NASH in particular, and then we can transition into the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a pleasure to, to be invited for this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Dimitri Tonev. I'm a, I'm a trained hepatologist uh, and uh, has been uh, having this uh, quite interesting journey from big pharma to small pharma to diagnostic companies, as well as device companies and a major, major CRO, all kind of around the conundrum of chronic liver diseases, which up until recently was mostly viral hepatitis B and C. But in the last decade or so, the attention of the world pharmaceutical industry, as, as well as the clinical societies across the globe are mostly kind of uh, focused on NASH, uh, fatty liver disease. So I've been obviously part of this journey, was working uh, for a company that was meant to be the, the first kind of comer to this space, uh, Interstep, and has after, afterwards done many other things in uh, the small uh, kind of biotech space, again, related to different liver diseases. And that's in a nutshell what I, I was doing in this disease for the last 10 years. Great, thanks so much. And how much have things changed and, and what in particular has changed over the last 10 years or so? It seems like now there's been an explosion of um, companies working in NASH in particular and, and trying to develop therapies. Has that always been the case and, and it just seems like it's exploded or, or has there been something or a set of things that have changed to spur that on? No, initially, initial players, for example, we wouldn't even remember these uh, attempts. For example, one of the first agents that has been kind of uh, thrown uh, in the mix uh, were predominantly uh, diabetes compounds. And they were driven, uh, these trials were driven by scientific societies like uh, uh, NASH CRN in the United States. That's to, to, to a large extent is also valid for beta cholic acid. So the public interest was so small that the companies themselves did not consider a major registrational trial in this disease. So that was done by academic institution. And that was, of course, uh, the very beginning of the journey of beta cholic acid in NASH. 
So uh, little by little, with the first encouraging results came the also interest of venture capitalist and overall investment kind of uh, part of the story, which was relatively active up until very recently. Nowadays, I believe there is a visible tendency not to invest that much in Nash, a chain of uh, disappointments and, and kind of negative trials. I'm hearing, not being a part of investment community, that it's now way more difficult to fund the clinical program specifically targeting Nash. So many other things have changed since the original uh, optimism uh, uh, for all of us uh, uh, working in pharma, as well as investigators and a clinical research organization, original optimism was that this big disease potentially will be an easy target, easy recruitment target. Nowadays, of course, uh, the, the conundrum changed completely and pretty much everybody understands that this is a disease when uh, uh, with a quite a, a long uh, and well-structured effort, you will be, might be able to recruit something like uh, 0.2 patients per site per month, which is the realistic figure most of the CROs are telling us nowadays. And of course, on the diagnostic side, we have seen also major changes from the uh, total dominance of uh, liver biopsy and histological assessment, which is still present uh, and very visible in the regulatory requirements for registration to a current, I would say, rebellion when many, many uh, physicians and KOLs are questioning the role of liver biopsy and histological assessment in the overall clinical development pathway for NASH. So pretty much, yeah, everything changed including the key players. Right, I'd like to come back to a few of these topics that you mentioned, one of them being the, the challenge with trial recruitment and the second one being the biomarkers. But before we dive into both of those, I wonder if you could just, in particular for anyone in the audience who isn't as familiar with the, with the disease and the therapy area, can you break down the scale um, of the number of, number of patients, for example, within uh, the category of you know, NAFLD as a whole, NASH, NASH fibrosis, how big of a um, group of people are we talking about here? Because one of the things that um, I think is striking about AFLD and NASH is if you look at diseases that affect a comparable number of people, there, there are a few others out there like it that have no approved therapies whatsoever. So I'm interested if you could just you know, talk through the, the scale in terms of the, the per percentage of the population or number of people worldwide. <laughs> So if we remember that we are talking about two distinguished uh, clinical entity, NAFLD and NASH, NASH being the more advanced, uh, aggressive uh, kind of uh, form of fatty liver disease, uh, where inflammation is driving the process of fibrosis further and a proportion of patients will end up with uh, zero, advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and end-stage liver disease. So I think that depending on the epidemiology of, uh, fat, of uh, uh, diabetes type 2 and obesity in your particular geography, uh, up to between 20 and probably 40% of the population will have uh, signs of uh, fatty liver disease, myself including. Surprisingly, when I have a, an MRI scan recently, I was having more than 10% uh, liver fat on MRI PDFF, which is typically a requirement to get this individual into a clinical study. So sometimes, obviously, a relatively healthy individuals could also have this, uh, these features. Of those millions of patients, uh, probably a very few, uh, around 10%, will progress to NASH and will take them some time to get there we are now kind of gradually abandoning the clinic, uh, the previous belief that patients with NAFOD are very stable and they almost like will never progress to NASH. Now we believe that this is possible. And once in the category of NASH, which effectively uh, uh, we will have to fit the histological definition of different scoring system, SAF, uh, which we have developed here in Europe and uh, an American uh, NAS uh, score, uh, you will then progress further following the steps of different degrees of fibrosis, F1, F2, F3, F4, uh, and therefore uh, we will become uh, with the time cirrhotic patients, whereby the features, clinical feature of cirrhosis will be present. And effectively, uh, we believe that the patients that, these are, these are very simple numbers and there are large geographical variation, but will patients that will be ever diagnosed as having NASH 
around 10% will probably end up in this, uh, this end-stage liver disease and will be either uh, lucky enough to be transplanted or will face the sequelae of uh, this uh, advanced liver disease, including liver-related death. So it's a, it's a big, big uh, population across the globe. It's expected to be the number one reason for liver transplantation in most of the developed economies. I think it's already number one in the United States, quickly replacing uh, the previous uh, leading position of hepatitis C. Some countries like UK, uh, alcoholic liver disease is still holding this quite, uh, uh, you know, kind of disappointing uh, position of being number one liver cure. Thanks, I really appreciate that. And, and maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about why trial recruitment is is so challenging because you you said it sounded like between one and 4% of people in a country have NASH um, with, you know, fewer than that having later stage uh, F3, F4 scale fibrosis. Um, so it's it's a, you know, huge proportion of the population. Why is it so challenging to to recruit for trials? I'd love for you to unpick the, the various reasons there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are lots of factors, uh, most of which are, are quite well known, but let me try to be a little bit more original in what I believe plays a role. I, I think the biggest the biggest reason probably is that patients are not where we would expect them to be. They're not in the hands of hepatologists beautifully listed in the nice Excel sheet with their degree of fibrosis and most recent uh, uh, fancy biochemical markers of liver inflammation and fibrosis. There are patients, typically the most advanced ones, that are already cirrhotic, that rightly were referred to hepatologists, but the ones that are predominant clinical trial materials based on regulatory guidance, patients with fibrosis F2 and F3, by and large are somewhere else with their GPs or with their endocrinologists or as diabetologists. And uh, also, by and large, given the little focus these two specialties were traditionally having on liver disease, they're not diagnosed, they're not considered uh, how, uh, under certain risk, and therefore they're not, re they're not referred to, to hepatology. So many clinical trials now are considering the role of referring physicians, uh, whereby uh, a network will be built around a hepatology unit with these patients uh, 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 with the, the desired the specific for this clinical trial features will be referred to this unit in order for their diagnostic process to be finalized and the decision whether they should be biopsied is taken by the leading PI. So number one reason, they are with other specialties uh, and not with hepatologists. Number two reason, patients do not know that they have this disease and most of the time, even more, they don't, they, they have never heard of this disease. So sometimes uh, a promotional, uh, not promotional, but some active campaign of patient screening uh, do really bring patients with surprising degree of liver disease to these uh, investigators, but patients first react with a little bit of disbelief when they were told that not only they have potentially dangerous, already advanced liver disease, but they will need a clinical trial uh, uh, to potentially take care of their uh, liver uh, steatosis, fibrosis. And for that reason, they will have to have something like between two and four biopsies the next two years. So for many of the patients, this is quite a, ne quite a negative surprise. So they not immediately consider trial participation as being a very good idea. And the third reason probably, which is a little bit uh, out, of the, out of the traditional list, uh, most of the academic, most of the clinical research in Europe at least is being done in academic institution. And academic hepatologists are extremely busy doing thousands of other things and, and taking care of patients uh, in the yard, including uh, transplant patients. So uh, a very labor intensive uh, 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 trial, so like NASH with a huge recruitment failure rate and with the need to dedicate considerable amount of time to talk and to patients and build a relationship with them is sometimes very, very difficult for a busy academic hepatology. So we see a clear pattern like uh, commercial research units, which are only focusing on clinical research, are way more successful in recruiting patients. And this is just the, the nature of, of this uh, clinical recruitment paradigm that we are now in the middle of. Right, thank you. That, that very clear overview. In terms of the 
solving the early detection and, and the second problem you noted, which is the vast majority of patients don't actually know they have NASH. Could you talk a little bit about this transition from biopsies towards other non-invasive biomarkers, blood-based biomarkers or fibro scan? What is that what does that look like today? And and what do you see on the horizon? Is there a technology approach to enable much lower cost and non-invasive screening in, in the next, you know, coming years to, to solve mm -hmm. this problem in some way? Let me let me dissect the question into into two parts. So when you speak about early detection, uh, you definitely speak about non-invasive technology because there's no way, no no disease ever will be first uh, and easy detected with an invasive technology, a sliver biopsy. So there are encouraging steps nowadays, including some that are already adopted uh, here in the NHS, uh, uh, more precisely Scottish uh, NHS whereby uh, a liver abnormality in a patient that is considered high risk, by, by liver abnormality, I mean uh, elevated transaminases, patient with high risk diabetes type 2 obese patients, which is having some other risk factors for liver disease. So this, this uh, biochemical abnormality will trigger automatically uh, at the WAP level an in, uh, investigation of the so-called liver panel. When are other than other than transaminases, bilirubin, albumin, platelets, and a couple of other uh, simple scores like FIB4 will be calculated. And even this GP who might or might not be interested in liver disease will get a, a flag that this patient needs to be, or it's a good idea to be referred to hepatology. So that's where I believe is the future of early detection uh, and active uh, kind of tracing and following up of potential uh, high-risk patients. As far as clinical trials are concerned, we have seen in the last 10 years explosion of different technologies. Uh, 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 first of all, imaging uh, technologies, uh, and I believe currently MRI, MRI, MRI is, uh, is playing the key role here with MRI-PDFF being the key kind of technology to detect and measure, quantify liver, liver steatosis. And MRE and uh, liver multi-scan being technologies which are uh, kind of growing their popularity as potential uh, ways to, to measure and quantify liver inflammation and fibrosis. And they are all now gradually uh, generating data whereby they prove their ability to predict outcomes, to predict big liver events. Uh, and that's uh, the name of the game because up until recently only liver histology was able to be associated with bad disease progression for a particular uh, number of patients. So uh, on a biochemical tests, there are uh, uh, also some uh, popular uh, uh, tests which are gaining more and more traction and are generating more and more data without at all being, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, able to list them all, but the proc free and the family of tests uh, developed by Nordic Bioscience, as well as uh, classical, I would say, ELF test that belongs to Siemens now, are being validated as well as uh, key tests, not only able to measure liver inflammation and fibrosis, but also to predict outcomes in a popula big populations of NASH patients. I'd love to talk a little bit about therapeutic um, options, because as you've said, the the clinical trial recruitment is very challenging and expensive, yet there are trials that successfully recruit and, and power through these challenges, um, but still there's been a string of failures. I wonder if you could talk about why that is from your perspective and, and also if there are any glimmers of hope there of um, why whether there are any that are in the pipeline that we should expect actually may be successful um, or, or if there aren't any that you're aware of, maybe we could talk a little bit about what you think people should be doing. There's definitely a very uh, still a very uh, powerful portfolio of uh, agents that are getting into a NASH clinical trial. Uh, there are uh, highly anticipated results uh, coming from the clinical trials that are still uh, open uh, in phase three, the decisive uh, pivotal clinical trials. Uh, between, uh, I, I would just mention the, the front runners, Madrigo is having not one of, but two trials in this space. Uh, uh, we have seen uh, recently some, uh, some announcements from uh, other companies uh, that are, they're waiting for their results, including, uh, unfortunately, a disappointing announcement from uh, Allergan slash Abdi for uh, Senecrivirog. 
But in general, there is no shortage of, uh, of clinical agents that are getting into uh, phase 2B and, and phase 3 uh, NASH clinical trials. The, the ability of these trials to recruit seemed reasonably unaffected during the COVID uh, kind of two waves. And as far as I'm aware, uh, even surprisingly so, uh, there, we have seen some uh, good uh, clinical trials completing uh, with both positive uh, and negative uh, results. So I believe that the, 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 the recipe for a recruitment, which is based uh, on a sequential kind of use of biochemical tests and then uh, elastography uh, seems to be working specifically in the in hands of fully dedicated physicians that are only doing uh, uh, this uh, type of clinical research. And those type of, uh, of site networks are, are quite popular in the United States and they are growingly growing in terms of numbers in Europe as well, frequently partnering with CROs uh, on the delivery of such a massive trial because uh, a big phase three trial, like for example, Regenerate, which is still uh, progressing and uh, waiting for additional results to be presented to FDA, typically requires more than 2000 patients and will run for five to seven years because other than the interim data, which are based on histological assessment after, for example, month 18, all these trials are supposed to bring a certain number, number of end stage liver disease event to be able to get their final approval from FDA or, or ABA. So it's a really a great, big, uh, quite long-term project for, for uh, all the parties involved. Which, which parts of the biological pathways do um, the, the drugs that are being put forth by groups like Madrigal target? I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you are um, or, or maybe not, but I'd be curious to understand um, what, what the different potential target routes are um, and, and what they're going after. Because I know there's a few different ways, to, ways that people are thinking about targeting NASH. You mean in terms of mechanism of action? That's right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, Madrigo uh, is having an agent that it's THR beta uh, kind of uh, agonist. It's, uh, it's an agent that it's uh, so far proven uh, very, very effective uh, in terms of uh, hitting one of the two potential histological endpoints, uh, namely NASH resolution, with also encouraging changes on the improve, improvement of fibrosis part of the spectrum. Uh, it's considered by many one of, the, one of the front runners, and they have also been able to convince the rest of the investment community in their ability to recruit patients. So this is uh, also a surprisingly important element of uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, dialogue between pharmaceutical biotech industry and investment community. Your ability to recruit patients in your trial is probably equally effective as you're encouraging preclinical or early clinical data. Uh, there are two other main kind of mechanism of action uh, which are uh, uh, frequently considered as a potential front runner. So that's the family of FXR agonists, uh, uh, including the, the kind of a, a front runner up until recently, obericolic acid. Once again, this uh, agent from uh, Intercept has been already registered for PBC. So it's a uh, well-known uh, entity uh, for the clinical uh, society, hepatology clinical society. Uh, there are a few other FXRs uh, in development, uh, uh, probably lately uh, kind of plucked by disappointing results, but I would anticipate some of the new generation of FXRs to definitely make it to the finish line. The, another big family that it's also uh, kind of working for a bioacid modulation, uh, it's the PPAR kind of agonist, and there are encouraging signs from uh, an, uh, an agent called Wanafibronor, which is uh, being developed by a small, uh, and now in phase three, by a small French uh, uh, biotech called Inventiva. Uh, it's a PPAR uh, in terms of mechanism of action. There are other uh, uh, also PPARs that are in advanced uh, development, including probably it's worth mentioning uh, Seladopar from Simabay because this is an agent that not only it's still in development for both for NASH and PBC, but it's largely, I believe, responsible for the recent rebellion that I would like to talk probably at the end of this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, the, the 
events and the observation that uh, have been uh, done uh, during the stopped NASH clinical trial of uh, CIMABE was a reason for lots of learning and lots of discussions and probably uh, a little bit of the change that we could see now in, the, uh, in this uh, paradigm. Are, are you seeing any um, uptick in genetically targeted therapies? So, so there's a couple um, that I'm aware of. There's the AstraZeneca um, program and PNPLA, targeting PNPLA3 homozygotes, um, the Alnolam and Regeneron um, combo group have been targeting, I believe, both PNPLA3 and also looking at uh, HSD17, B13 as as a target. I'm curious whether you see this as a trend that's growing because um, it, it's it, it, there have been a couple of very convincing genetic hits from my perspective that could inform the the target in biology. Um, maybe we can talk about genetics as as part of a diagnostic strategy as well a little bit later. But I'm interested first in in thinking about genetics and how it's being used in in um, you know precision therapies or or target identification. Are you seeing that as a as a growing trend? Definitely. I mean, they haven't been in that much uh, under the spotlights because none of these uh, agents, it's, uh, it's uh, reasonably well advanced. That by advanced, uh, I would consider the ones that are really uh, important for investment community are uh, assets which are beyond phase 2A, ideally with already available histological data from phase 2B. But the companies you did mention uh, are definitely uh, uh, kind of leading the pack. There is uh, uh, obviously the precedent of a couple of successful treatments already registered by uh, Alnylam for other liver diseases, uh, porphyria uh, and other uh, orphan liver diseases. So there is also a huge amount of antisense oligonucleotides that are being developed for the sake of hepatitis B treatment which uh, is another kind of big uh, area in the liver diseases that is currently being uh, actively pursued. So uh, I believe this is uh, uh, from what I'm hearing from uh, colleagues uh, interested in kind of in this space, these are three druggable targets. And now if we are moving into more and more kind of uh, uh, precise uh, ways of drug development in NASH, I would anticipate that the uh, uh, genetic markers and, and genetic predisposition of patients will be definitely something important when selecting in the future the best population to test your, your agent. So obviously, current kind of name of the game for most of the biotechs was the NASH in its entirety. All the patients uh, with NASH and many will consider this a very complex disease with many different subtypes. Uh, so, therefore, a more precise risk stratification and studying a particular mode of action in a particular subgroup of patients is probably a more effective and hopefully even cheaper way to, to get to the, to the registration. Now, there was until recently a company that was intending to particularly study NAFOD and NASH in HIV patients, uh, and they, uh, I believe, have reasonable uh, chances to be successful. So, this is just as an example of what you could do to target a smaller population with, with a greater chances of success. Uh, and and gen gen genotyping definitely will be a, a part of this future stratification. There are, funnily enough, most of the major uh, consortiums, at least in, in, in Europe, about the uh, collaborative uh, uh, kind of investigation of a big liver disease, as well as some of the orphan drug diseases, were organized mostly of physicians with interest in, in genetics. And after the great successes of UK PBC and global PBC groups, now we see a chain of consortiums here in Europe that kind of started with FLIP, then uh, EPOS and now LITMUS, whereby these features of disease uh, are between the factors that are being uh, investigated and hopefully will be able to help us to better select patients for clinical trials tomorrow. I'd uh, like to translate in a moment into the Q and A because we've had a couple come through, but I did want to ask one more pretty general question for you, which is whether there are some topics that no one is really discussing in Nash, but but you think they should be. And in particular, you alluded to 
um, a revolt or revolution earlier. I'd, I'd love to hear you know any of those sorts of things that are on your mind. Yeah, I mean that that's uh, that, that that's not necessarily something that uh, our audience have never heard before. But I'm, I will be just I will be just interested to to get their opinion, and definitely there might be uh, questions coming in this respect. I was quite quite impressed by a recent webinar organized by American Association ASLD, where the young generation of uh, American hepatologists have constructively and based on uh, valid arguments and figures pretty much uh, disputed the role of liver biopsy as our main tool used in, in the drug development in NASH. And I have never seen this before in such a well-organized and well-argumented manner. So I think we are seeing the first signs of revolution because not only they have shown multiple weaknesses of liver biopsy and subsequent histological assessment, but they have also recommended non-invasive ways how you could do potentially phase to be in phase three trial, not only for general NASH candidate, but based on particular modes of action, which was brilliantly done. And uh, I definitely believe that part of this revolt is probably driven by the surprising findings of the Simo Bay study that I did mention previously, whereby unusual histological findings were found in this trial which was immediately attributed, that's how our pharmacovigilance uh, reactions normally works, immediately attributed to the agent uh, that has been uh, studied in this particular trial. And so it happened that it ended up that 99% of these unusual histological findings, which are in, in, with a broad kind of description of features of cholestatic liver disease, was found not only at the end of the trial, but also at the baseline, so they were there before the agent was uh, administered to this patient. So that helped us to understand that we don't fully understand the histological features of NASH and sometimes uh, are probably getting lucky uh, when evaluating whether they are changing or improving. And together with the fact that we have a, a handful of high profile, very capable liver pathologists, but pretty much not that many from a new generation that follow into their footsteps the society probably is rightly thinking that we will have to find another way to stratify liver disease and to actually uh, be able to consider one agent as successful or not. So this is one of the, I believe, relatively new elements that might not have been seen by, by everybody. And, and of course, it's my personal interpretation. The other one we have touched already, uh, I think it will be clever for the future to uh, stratify and find a specific population of NASH patients that are probably the most likely candidates to respond to your treatment. Instead of going for each and every NASH that's out there and ending with a highly statistically significant 20% response rate, which then the clinical society and a regulatory agency will question in terms of not being overly effective, specifically if you have some safety signals simultaneously developing. So other, other features, I believe, uh, were, uh, other new elements of the, uh, this uh, conundrum were, of course, the increased involvement of uh, endocrinologists and diabetologists into this clinical trial, initially as referring physicians, but uh, more recently as also as investigators, and the gradual kind of uh, 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 replacement of certain uh, pre-screening uh, technologies with uh, modern tests uh, from the families that we have already briefly discussed at the very beginning of this conversation. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to transition into uh, Q and A. We've got a couple of great questions that came through. I'm actually going to bring uh, Graham Mills, who asked two really good questions, up, and and he can ask them live. So hopefully he'll join us in a second. Graham, welcome. Over to you. Thank you, and you can hear me okay. So, yes, so, right. Excellent. I'm, I'm really interested in discussing further about acolic acid in particular. I think the, the outcome or the complete response letter from the FDA was, was definitely surprising, but I don't think necessarily closed the door to its eventual approval. So, Dimitar, I'm interested in your perspective on if you think a better acolic acid may eventually be approved. Um, and, and somewhat linked to that is a second question. Obviously, a lot of people are talking about anacanumab 
probably pronouncing that wrong. The Alzheimer's drug approved uh, this week on some questionable clinical data, which the FDA seemed to have approved because the unmet need in Alzheimer's is really so, so extreme, I think, which has parallels with NASH. So the second part of that question then is, do you think some of these recent developments in approvability of drugs in areas of unmet need might also influence a better colic acid and NASH? So, uh, I mean, let me let me start with some disclosures that um, I'm not privy to any uh, kind of uh, confidential data, uh, regardless of my previous affiliation with the company. So I could only tell you what is already being uh, extensively discussed in a public space. Obviously, the, the facts are that uh, Intercept have reached uh, their interim data point. Uh, one of the two acceptable FDA uh, histological kind of criteria for uh, them to be granted uh, a provisional license in NASH. And surprisingly for many, the regulatory, uh, well-respected regulatory agency decided not to give them a provisional license. So for many, that was moving the goalpost. Uh, for others, this was uh, uh, probably justified there are speculations around what exactly was driving this uh, change of mind at fda level uh, not only that there were of course new uh, faces and capable uh, new hepatology kind of uh, uh, specialists which are now sitting uh, at the agency but also uh, all sorts of different uh, theories so one of the one of the uh, uh, popular theories was uh, talking about uh, risk-benefit uh, ratio. And you know, approximately 20% of the patients uh, in, uh, in the Regenerate st uh, study and this uh, uh, kind of uh, interim uh, uh, data point uh, reach the uh, criteria for fibrosis improvement. Together with their ability to unfortunately worsen uh, the lipid profile of these patients and uh, sometimes quite uh, kind of uh, intensive uh, pruritus that is seen also in, in NASH patients, that might have been uh, the reason, the rationale behind the speculation about not so favorable risk-benefit uh, ratio, even if uh, from what we do know uh, so far, uh, ubetic oleic acid is not, has never been considered as increasing the cardiovascular uh, kind of risk uh, of patients in NASH. Uh, so this is just a, a theoretical suspicion. Uh, uh, agency obviously uh, kind of concluded their communication with Intercept with the request for more data. And, and here is the problem that nobody knows what exact data they are talking about, because if they are talking about uh, endpoints and events uh, data, which uh, based on the design of this trial will come after five years, this is really bad news for Intercept stock because it will take some time for this type of data to be generated and made available to the agency and therefore for the product to be uh, officially uh, licensed for the treatment of NASH. Uh, if these are just additional safety data to further validate the changes in blood lipids, a potential ways to rectify those with a simultaneous application of statin, or the very well-known fact now, at least from uh, PBC uh, disease, that patients get used to this pruritus and it's no longer a bothersome phenomenon after a few months on treatment and proper titration of the ubetic oleic acid dose, uh, uh, I, I really don't know uh, at this stage, but it was a, a very interesting story, still is, and badly, badly affected the uh, kind of uh, capital valuation of the company during the last uh, six months or so. Thanks for that, Dimitar. Graham, feel free to unmute if you have any quick follow-ups, otherwise I, I'll move on to the next question. That's perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, so we had another question asking you to tell us more about the current biomarkers that are being used. I wonder if you could maybe talk through to the extent possible what a typical patient journey would look like in terms of um, you know, the, the kind of testing and diagnostic biomarkers being used, and then maybe what a journey looks like for someone that's in, in a more cutting edge um, you know, academic medical center or, or somewhere else that's using some of the latest and greatest. Uh, if you could do that, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, very, very briefly. And once again, I don't have a, a ready uh, off the shelf solution 
for a quick diagnostic assessment of, of a NASH patients, but I have a very good example from this country, uh, from UK, which uh, each and every on this call, uh, specifically my colleagues, could find easily online. So it's called Camden and Islington uh, Liver Commissioning Pathway. And it's being prepared by an excellent uh, group of uh, hepatologists at Royal Free Hospital. I think currently is also being taken uh, uh, as uh, part of the armamentarium of the GPs uh, of North London, probably other areas. And it's based on a very logical and very kind of uh, beautiful principle. So you start from a group of patients with risk factors excluding some other risk factors. So you're mostly interested in diabetes type two and obesity, but let's say if the patient has a history of some intravenous drug use, you would then want to exclude uh, uh, that patient might have some uh, serological or, or kind of genetic signs of hepatitis C. So it's, it's quite well organized and uh, it's using a technology, diagnostic technology that it's fully available in the hand of NHS, uh, uh, con contracted by NHS GP. And then it comes to the, it comes to the important part. Uh, in this particular uh, pathway, there are many similars which are slightly different. They're using a very basic uh, risk score called FIP4, which is effectively a well-known uh, uh, scoring, scoring system, a simple formula, which includes only four criteria, AST, ALP, these are two liver uh, or, or we call them liver, even if they're not only specific for the liver, uh, platelets and the age of the patients. And based on these four parameters, the formula is uh, widely available. You could have a calculator on your iPhone. You end up with a score. So if it's more than 1.3, this is a patient that might have some kind of a risk uh, for uh, to present with advanced uh, liver fibrosis. But be between 1.3 and 2.67, this type of patient is in the so-called gray zone. We are not quite sure whether they are with normal kind of liver uh, uh, histology or could be abnormal and it's worth uh, having a further investigation. So here comes the role of the second test. A more specific uh, kind of test uh, could be, could be uh, another biochemical test like ELF score, which is widely available on, on NHS. It's manufactured by major uh, diagnostic corporation Siemens, or if you don't have access to ELF, but you're lucky enough in your hospital to have a, a fibro scan, or you could refer easily, particularly for fibro scan, and let's say this type of practice do exist in many uh, parts of this country, I think was pioneered by Guru Aitao in Nottingham. You could refer the patient to hospital to have this quick assessment of your, his or her liver elasticity. And this second, test actually defines whether the patient indeed needs to go to visit hepatologist or could stay with his general practitioner for the further follow-up and subsequent tests, which are typically suggested to be on a yearly, yearly basis. I think they, in the original kind of publication of this pathway, they considered patients with, uh, with transient elastography of more than 9.8 as the ones that needs to be referred to to liver hepatologists. And while this kind of score was created, obviously to release the pressure of a necessary referral to always busy, extremely kind of talented NHS hepatologist, it also works in a slightly different way. It helps them to find these patients that once they do not have anything uh, else to uh, offer them uh, other than typical dietary kind of restrictions and physical activity, could well be in their capable hands of good, a good candidates for trials. So it's not only helping NHS not to have an expensive and necessary referral to specialists, but it also is helping physicians to have a, a, a good choice of patients that might benefit from clinical trials. So it's a beautiful test. And there are many others done uh, elsewhere in different countries in Europe that are following the same logic. Great, thank you. Another question that's um, you know, maybe related actually is how we get pharma companies to think beyond the current status quo liver biopsies and to the question says an adopt genetic testing, but if I can, I'll go a little broader and, and say to think about 
expanding the pool of, of patients and expanding access to diagnostics. So getting away from um, this very challenging enrollment rate and, and to some extent fighting over the same patients that meet the same criteria at the same centers and, and widening the pool a little bit. Do you think that's, that is pharma's responsibility to help accelerate that? And, and if so, how, um, you know, how, do we, how do we achieve that? I, I don't believe that there is a kind of an inherited conflict between the desire of pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to register product and the current kind of restrictive, uh, should we say, diagnostic pathway that it's considered by the uh, regulatory agency. I think pharmaceutical companies are hugely interested to have more and more validated non-invasive tests. First, to identify potential NASH patients. Second, probably even more importantly, to be able to validate treatment response when they treat those patients. And third, to be able to prove to the world that, that the risks, long-term risk for these patients to get to liver transplantation and cirrhosis, again, based on biomarkers, it's way smaller than before the initiation of, of treatment. So they will be very, very happy if such tests, more of these tests exist and are gradually being kind of uh, uh, considered as a part of the drug development conundrum and, and, uh, and what is recommended by the label, uh, in the label of these uh, products. Just one example, not so far uh, long ago, we were using liver biopsy to justify that a certain patients need to start treatment for hepatitis C at the time when we were treating these patients with interferon and ribavirin. Little by little, with the invention of new uh, treatment options, the so-called direct acting antivirals, the uh, popularity of Fibroscan to provide information about the degree of liver inflammation and fibrosis before treatment uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, such that the, the, the available data were so convincing then gradually the kind of uh, insistence on liver biopsy, I think completely disappeared in each and every national consensus for the treatment of hep C. I would foresee that the same thing will happen with, with NASH. The moment we have more and more treatments available, the necessity to diagnose and validate treatment in millions of patients that are initiating treatment will probably push away biopsy and it keep it as a reserved kind of a diagnostic tool for diagnostically complex patients. And there will be always patients like this, but the day-to-day -day diagnostic work will be probably done by non-invasive technology and which might be a simple biochemical test or an elastography or a combination of them with MRI, uh, which is uh, probably the way uh, we have done it in, in hepatitis C case. Great, thank you. We, we had a really interesting question come in from Joshua Friedman. We've got, I think, time for two more questions here through the chat. Um, his question was whether you could offer a reaction to the failure of Alda Furman, um, despite the promising phase 2A results and, and their subsequent decision to end development in NASH. I um, wonder if you have any, any thoughts on that and uh, insight into why that decision was made. I, I, I obviously do not have any any uh, any uh, kind of excessive uh, or different wisdom, but there was, funnily enough, a recent meeting, literally two days ago, of the European Society of Diabetes NAFOD study group, which was focused on the, the preclinical kind of uh, justification and some of the clinical data in existence for this family of agents, FGF19 and FGF21 analogs. Uh, of which there are two others that are still in the active uh, clinical development for NASH. So the prominent physicians around the table, Steve Harris and Arun Sanyal, were talking about the potential small sample size of the phase two trials with, uh, with aldofarmin, which were the uh, well-known Alp Alpine trials, and, and the fact that, uh, uh, that was probably, we were probably seeing a case of uh, type two error in the uh, assessment of the uh, decisive uh, histological clinical trial that recently presented some data. I was personally disappointed because we always consider this agent as one of the front runners in terms of showing convincing efficacy before that. 
and uh, also one of the agents that gave us quite a lot of warnings because in holostatic liver disease, this same kind of mode of action have shown to the world that it's possible to improve liver histology without working on the well-known uh, holostatic uh, parameters like ALP. So I had lots of sympathy for, for this uh, small company uh, uh, in, in South San Francisco. But what exactly have happened? Uh, we'll probably have some interesting data coming up uh, at SLD from Akiro, which is studying similar uh, mode of action. Uh, hopefully some new data from BMS uh, to pretty much be able to adjudicate whether this approach to NASH is really uh, something that will be successful at the end. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, we've covered biomarkers, we've covered challenges and trials, we've covered genetics, we've covered future therapy areas. I think we've covered just about everything and, and more that we set out to. I think it's a great final question, which is what are you most excited about in the future of NASH drug development? And, and it can be a couple of things, obviously, in the last few minutes here. Oh, two things uh, that I'm kind of partly uh, involved with, but I, I wouldn't talk about companies that I'm currently consulting for because it wouldn't be uh, a, fair, uh, a fair kind of representation of the overall clinical landscape. But there are companies that are somehow put off by the uh, decreasing uh, financial or investment support for NASH clinical trials, which are reconsidering their promising agents and moving more in the direction of, uh, of liver, advanced liver fibrosis and cirrhosis. So we have seen the first way of failure uh, uh, with NASH cirrhosis, uh, with a couple of great companies reporting negative results. But these new players are having a better idea how to do it, and they do not consider necessarily NASH as the only etiology, the only reason why patients get into cirrhotic stage that it's worth treating. So they will go for pretty much the whole shenanigans, alcohol, viruses, NASH, uh, and cholestatic liver disease. And this is very exciting for me because nothing like this has ever happened before, and we don't have even a single antifibrotic agent except antivirals, which has been ever registered for liver disease. So that's, that's a great development. The second element, it's kind of quite similar, but there is growing understanding that still to hepatitis, which is the, the kind of a, the main feature of NASH, it's also or, or almost the similar kind of histological foundation of the alcohol-related liver disease. And there are other types of steatohepatitis that also are developing based on a different kind of uh, other etiological factors. So there will be, I believe, and there are signs of this happening, more emphasis on alcoholic liver disease, which was very stigmatized and forgotten for a number of years. But based on the great efforts of physicians like uh, Mark Turtz and, and others, now they're gradually coming back to the fore and probably will benefit from this intense drug development that was originally targeting NASH, but might well be able to help uh, patients with uh, alcoholic liver disease, which again have somehow similar histological features. Great. Well, well thank you so much. I'm, I'm just going to um, share screen here for our final uh, set of takeaways here. Um, and, and then we'll close out here a minute or two early to give everybody a break in case they're in back-to-back -back meetings. So obviously, big thank you to you, Dimitar. Really appreciate it. I think, as, as I said prior to the last question, we covered a huge amount of ground. And, uh, and I personally learned a ton from you, and I, I hope the audience did as well. Um, we're going to follow up to everyone with a recording and, and a summary blog post, so you'll expect to get that within the next week or two. Uh, our general email contact at Sinogenetics is there if you have ideas for you know, more of these that you'd like to see, or if you want to get in touch with our team, um, then, then feel free to send us an email. And then finally, I'll, I'll just plug our uh, podcast. If We have some NASH and NAFLD related uh, past interviews on here, including the one recently with, with Josh Friedman from uh, Al Nylum. Um, and we have others that cover genetics more broadly, including uh, Professor Robert Green from Harvard and, and other uh, luminaries in the field. So check that out if you're interested. Um, and more of those sorts of things. And, and otherwise, I'll close out there and, and just say thank you very much to Matar and, and for everyone in the audience for all your great questions and for joining. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will continue these conversations in the future. Absolutely. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks.